should be more security. Um, what we have seen and heard recently from Brussels and EU member states is rather discouraging us, not encouraging. Um, mm. Is European Union really upgrading European uh, Eastern European Eastern Partnership Initiative or downgrading it, making it uh, even less ambitious than it was at? Um, when the uh, Eastern Partnership uh, was launched in Prague back in, in 2009. Do we need to refresh Eastern Partnership or significantly renew it? Can Eastern Partnership initiative be sustainable and not success and successful without clear tailor-made approach? Is there a risk that instead of more for more approach, we will in fact get less for more policy? With those questions in mind, I would like to pass the floor to a co-organizer of today's event, one of the biggest promoter of Eastern Partnership ambitious agenda for associated trio, which is Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, a member of European Parliament, Andreas Kubilius. Mr. Kubilius, what message did you bring us today? Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Alona, and uh, I'm really too, very happy to see all of you, you know, friends, both from, from Brussels and from, from Kiev. Uh, uh, yes, with, uh, uh, with our Eastern Neighborhood, uh, Neighborhood East Forum, we are co-organizers of this event, and I think that this is a very important event exactly in a very good time, because just recently we had uh, Western Balkans, summit and we're coming to Eastern Partnership Summit. And uh, I would uh, be very happy to hear, you know, answers from Ukrainians, what is, in their view, what is an ambitious post-2020 agenda. But I'm always uh, worrying that, you know, on our side, on EU side, we also need to ask ourselves a very simple question. What is our, you know, ambitious post-2020 agenda? And uh, exactly when I see, you know, Western Balkans as really very big success of uh, EU geopolitical, you know, developments uh, with really very clear language, which I always uh, was praising when I was uh, listening to either Commission President or, or Vice President for Foreign uh, and Security Policy for no Ursula von der Leyen or Mr. Borrell, when they were speaking in a very clear way that if EU is not coming into Western Balkans, then either Russia or even maybe China or even Turkey can destabilize Western Balkans. So when I'm looking into Eastern Partnership region, I see that Russia really is very, is very successful in destabilizing, you know, at least in attempting uh, to destabilize, you know, the whole region. Uh, luckily, you know, Ukrainians are very good to defend themselves. But I do not see very clear, you know, EU strategy, how not to allow to destabilize uh, really the region. Where is EU strategy? So, uh, and that is why I am uh, trying to see possibilities, uh, you know, what, uh, what we can do now, still, you know, Eastern Partnership Summit, maybe we'll have declaration. We shall uh, discuss next week in, in AFET, in European Parliament, uh, report on Eastern Partnership future. We had communication from Commission. We had uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Council uh, uh, decision on Eastern Partnership future. Some of those documents, well, I'm not so happy uh, because maybe I have uh, too, too, too large a dream to see much more of ambitions. But uh, things are not ending with, with forthcoming Eastern Partnership Summit. Uh, at least I would urge to look into next decade both from Ukrainian side, what kind of ambition Ukraine has, and what kind of ambition we need to have on EU side. How to make really more for more, but not more of the same all the time. Even, you know, as Alona have said in a very proper way, uh, not uh, more of downgrading. So that's, that's my, 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 my vision, my, 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 you know, view, and I see really major goal for us, you know, with whom I would call, you know, friends of Eastern Partnership in, in uh, European Parliament, in EU, 
in, 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 in Brussels, but let's say the whole, the whole Brussels bubble, that at least I see, I see really what we can try to do. We can try to make much more of similarity in between of, you know, Eastern partnership, at least three of countries who are, you know, uh, who are most advanced countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, despite, despite all the problems, you know, in those countries. But to make those countries really uh, to, to start to feel that for them possibility to follow uh, Western Balkans road is, is, is really coming closer and closer. But that will depend very much both on what is happening in, in, uh, in, the, in those Eastern Partnership countries, three countries, and how much in, in EU, on the EU side, also we're able to make, you know, steps forward. So I would like to use my, you know, this opportunity to praise Ukrainian, you know, uh, political, political, you know, ruling party and, and coalition uh, who supported uh, really very important so-called anti-Kolomoisky law. Uh, that's very clear, clear step forward. That is more uh, what we are expecting from, from Ukraine. How we shall respond on the EU side, how we shall make more for more, I am still not, 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 not so sure. But uh, of course, there are also, we need to be, to, be, to be very, very, very clear. There are a lot of things which still need to be, to be done, especially strengthening democracy, especially strengthening rule of law, especially strengthening those basic values. Because we see that really that is always quite a big problem in all the post-Soviet uh, uh, you know, area. And uh, luckily, you know, maybe Ukraine, Ukraine really is, is doing good progress in that, in that field and can become a good example also for other uh, uh, trio countries. We have now some, some discussions with our friends in Georgia and I'm always showing Ukraine as a good example. So, Thanks a lot again for this seminar. Thank you, Ms. Kubilis. Now we are moving to Christian Danielson, Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations at the European Commission. Uh, Mr. Danielson, there have been many initiatives to include a security dimension in the Eastern Partnership, but it didn't happen. Why the EU is so reluctant to develop the security dimension? Is it because some member states are afraid to irritate Russia, or there are some other reasons for that? Oh, I'm on. It's a bit odd, isn't it, this kind of uh, uh, meeting, shall we call it that, but we start to get used for it. Uh, this is my fourth VTC today. I think that's similar to you all. Uh, but let me start up by, by thanking Andreas Yu and, and also um, the uh, New Europe Centre to organise this today. It is timely, as you pointed to, Andrews. It comes at the right time, both in terms of our reflection internally in the EU when it comes to Eastern Partnership, but I also think it comes at the right time in, the, in our relations with Ukraine and, uh, and the, the discussions that we are going to have up towards the summit that will come towards the fall. So for all those reasons, I think it's very, very good. And before I reply to your question, which I'm not sure I'm going to reply to, completely to your, to your satisfaction. Let me start up perhaps to, do, to, to look into three elements, which I think is important in this debate. The first is COVID-19, because I think we can't discuss anything today without having that environment in, in our minds. The second is to say two words about the bilateral relations with Ukraine, and in particular the importance, as you pointed to, Andreas, of the reforms. And the third is that I would like to say two words about the the Eastern Partnership and how I see that one linking in. Starting with the COVID, just there I would like to show, I mean, we started in the EU, I think, a bit, me and myself, and I think that was for everybody. But uh, after a fairly short while, there was a recognition that this is something which can only be addressed together. And I think that recognition is very much there also towards partners. And, and that is why we have reached out and also I think, uh, Vadim, you uh, very much, uh, reached out towards us and said to how can we work together in order to meet this challenge in Ukraine, but also, of course, in Europe. And it's a link together. Uh, and I think that's the right approach. And I think that is the approach we will see very much more of as we are moving, here, moving forward. We came into this crisis together. We will have to try to find a way out of it together. 
And that, I think, should be the way that we should look on it. In concrete terms, first commend Ukraine for what you did. You came in very early with your uh, measures uh, at home, so to say. And my understanding is that when it comes to the statistics, it looks quite good. Uh, now, for our part, uh, we, we tried to reflect on how we could support. And I think now we have found a way where we are working together, both in terms of a substantive financial support, 190 million euro, which has been redirected towards mitigating COVID. Concretely, what it's about, it's about protecting equi protective equipment, it's about testing, it's about laboratory equipment, but it's also a substantive part of going down into the real economy, supporting small and medium-sized enterprise to be able to come over this, this crisis. And it is also support towards the, the uh, uh, stability, uh, macro-financial stability of Ukraine in the form of the uh, macro-financial assistance, 1.2 billion, which is now... Uh, also, I think Andrew just decided upon just this uh, the other day, and which will, I suppose, be very, very important. And in addition, the 500 million that is still remaining of the macro-financial assistance package that is on the table. So all of that together, I think, shows clearly a solidarity that is there, working together, and we need to see to that that message comes out in Ukraine and also within, within the EU. We will have to continue to work together. This will not go away, so I can foresee that it will be further increased. There has been one also which I think meets a bit, and just what you said, namely, how can we bring Ukraine into what we are doing also from the policy side? And that is the fact that Ukraine now has joined this specific group of health officials that is day to day looking into the development of COVID and what measures that can be taken nationally, but also jointly in trying to, to address it. So that's on the COVID side. And I think the next step for it is to look into the uh, recovery. We are doing that internally in the EU. And in the coming weeks, there will come a major package from the Commission side, which I'm sure the European Parliament and the Council will be interested to look on. I won't go into the details, you follow it in the newspapers, but it's going to be substantial. And I think we need to reflect on how we can discuss with Ukraine ways and means to see to that your recovery package is going to be of the kind that, that really helps you to take off and, and at least try to get back some of the growth of the, of the part of the economy that is lost in this, in this crisis that we are living on. But even though COVID will be very much the focus, I think it's immensely important that we keep the, uh, the uh, uh, clear eyes on what is, what is needed in order for moving, as you pointed to, Andreas, Andreas of seeing to that Ukraine step by step comes closer towards the EU. And there, of course, it is the association agreement, association agenda, it is the reforms. It is continuing to see to that investments are coming into Ukraine. It's continuing to see to that economic links becomes closer and closer. And here there are measures that you all know about. Of course, the reforms are particularly important. And uh, Vadim, I would like to commend the, the Ukrainian government for the reform agenda. Uh, I, clearly, there are issues which perhaps uh, could have been addressed. Uh, we would have advised, and I think we did even more, uh, how shall I put it, ambitiously. And there were signs also of steps which uh, we probably would have advised uh, would not, should not necessarily have been taken. But that's part of, of reforms, they are difficult. We will continue to, to, uh, to advise, to, to, to support you on these reform efforts. And of course, what happened over the last week uh, is, I understand, very important, uh, both the land reform and the, the banking, banking, uh, banking law uh, are essential elements for Ukraine, for Ukrainian citizens, for the economy of Ukraine, but also for the perception of Ukraine from the outside. And incidentally, will trigger the IMF macrofinancial support and also the macrofinancial support from the EU. For the further reforms, I think we, we will continue to push for reform of judiciary. We will continue to push for the importance of fighting corruption. We will continue to push for the uh, importance of public administrative reform. And we will continue to suggest that it's good to move in the direction of de oligarchization which I understand is also part of the government's program and it's going to be very, very important. 
All of that will be supported by our various kinds of instruments that you all know about. And, and we look forward to coming closer, step by step, working with you very closely on it. On the economic side, uh, we, will, we will work with you in seeing to that you get better access to the European market. And I think ACCA is going to be very important. That is seeing to that we can eliminate quite a few of the technical barriers to trade between us. Uh, this is a two-way street. We will do what we can on our side to step up that process. Uh, we are then counting on that you are doing the same on your side. And then hopefully we can move forward with it in a not too, too distant future. It will be important for the free movement of, of goods. Now, moving over to the, to the Eastern Partnership, I don't see any, any contradiction between the ambitions of the Eastern Partnerships, which is substantial, and the fact that Ukraine should be able to move forward ambitiously on its reform agenda and coming closer to the EU. So th th we shouldn't see them as, as contradicting each other, but rather supporting each other. And Andrews, I think, I think right now we are in a situation where uh, the next step for the Eastern Partnership is going to be framed. We put the communication on the table from the Commission side in March. There were the conclusions from the Council in now very recently. Parliament has been working as well and it's moving forward towards a summit which we don't know yet when it will take place. It will be, I think, very, very important that uh, from our part that, uh, that we have concreteness in that one, uh, what we would like to see achieved, and also necessary flexibility in order to cater for the differences between the countries who are part of the Eastern Partnership. In terms of areas, clearly the economy, and here issues such as the trans-European networks, connectivity, investments in connectivity between the Eastern Partnership countries and the EU and between the Eastern Partnership countries themselves are going to be very important, just as one example. Clearly, we are going to work on the digital. Uh, that is something which is going to come and where the growth potential for countries like Ukraine is immense. I mean, it's interesting when you look on statistics on the kind of internet activities and you know, information technology uh, activities in Ukraine compared to other countries, uh, startups, etc. It's quite impressive. And this needs to be used to its utmost in order also to be in the Eastern Partnership context. And of course, bringing together, it's both about infrastructure, but also beyond that. It is about the whole issue of uh, climate and, uh, and uh, a green deal, as we call it. When we are going to move out of uh, into recovery, we will be very, very, I, I believe, we will see where we land, we're very keen to see to that that recovery is made in such a way that the economy that is being invested in will be the economy of the future. And that means Green Deal, that means looking into the whole issue of energy systems, that means issues relating to biodiversity and resources. And I'm sure that that is something where we can work quite a lot also within the Eastern Partnership structure. And it is about people to people and the whole issue of societal uh, bringing together, civil society not least important. And finally, it is about governance. Uh, I believe that there is a lot of stuff that can be done in the Eastern Partnership when it comes to democracy, when it comes to rule of law, and when it comes to sharing experiences between mayors from various cities, etc. In concrete terms, I would like to see something similar to the strategies that were so successful the 2020-20 that came about uh, as a result of the last time we reflected on Eastern Partnership. What form it will take, I think you are very much into that game. Your suggestions will be most important in order to see to that the, the, it comes out in a good way. Now, security. Of course, that is part of it. All of these elements are dependent on security. And I disagree with you, Aliona, that security is not part of um, of what we are doing under the Eastern Partnership. It's not hard security because EU is not in that game, but we are very much on security when it comes to cyber security, when it comes to issues relating to fighting crime, when it comes to issues to fighting corruption, if you can put that into the security envelope. And I would argue also when it comes to strategic, uh, strategic communication, strategic information, disinformation, which is very much linked to security. But hard security is of course something which doesn't fall under either what the EU does from that point of view, or for that sake, what we can put into the Eastern Partnership. And I'll stop here. Thank you. 
Uh, our next panelist uh, and our next distinguished panelist, I would say, is Vadim Prestaiko, uh, who is Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. And my question to you, um, is Ukraine actually going to quietly accept Eastern Partnership Policy formal update, or we are going to strive for its upgrade? Update or upgrade? Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, again, happy to see all of you, especially those ones who join us a bit later. Uh, before I start, I just had uh, a privilege to hear to uh, the, the initial uh, statements. And I'd like to thank for everybody who mentioned the reforms and, and the laws which our members of parliament managed to take. And I have to tell you that you know, sometimes we can move pretty fast, especially when we kicked in the right direction, in the right place. So don't shy away. Feel free to kick us when need. One day we will be a member of uh, EU and then we'll pay off to everybody who did it through the all long decades of, of our cooperation and integration. But as of now, and back to our, to our point of our discussions, thank you, Alena. And again, just, just one more thing. Uh, uh, the, the important part is the our joint effort against the virus. That's what we are doing and that's what we are now discussing. I had yesterday the privilege to talk to European Commission where we are discussing how we can practically uh, try to access the assistance already offered, everything, uh, the financial and practical. We also discussed how Ukraine can find its part and we already seen that Ukraine is, is playing quite a significant role in airlift and some other protection things like, like I don't know, disinfectants and the rest. So this is the good cooperation and we still need it. We are not even in the peak of the, of the virus uh, pandemic, especially in, the, in, the, in Ukraine yet. But I hope that with the careful approach, us in European Union we will be able to manage with the less uh, the lives lost. But back to the, uh, our agenda and, and Eastern Partnership, let me start with so obvious of uh, thanking to the European Parliament and the members of the continuing support of Ukraine and our integration. My special graduates are going to the reporters for the initial uh, report, initial idea report on Eastern Partnership. And I'm also practically, particularly grateful to Mr. Kubilius, the, the Sandra Kalniet, Radoslav Sikorsky, Razo Jinkevicheni, and everybody who managed to have the time and, and, and strength to come with all these 503, 32 amendments, which formidable number and clearly demonstrates the interest towards the issue with the partnership and Ukraine's part of it. I hope that these ideas will be finalized in the report, which I hope they will be for the vote in June. Uh, to the uh, particular uh, questions. We have just a couple of uh, key points I'd like to share with you. And needless to remind that the, uh, this, uh, the, with the strategic course is remain unchanged, full membership, and this integration in EU and NATO alike is the key pillar of our foreign policy and hasn't been, met, it hasn't been changed. Although we have discussions within the, within the society, which is sign of healthy society and healthy discussion among our expert circles. I, as a Vice Prime Minister, I can tell you that I don't feel that this course is threatened. We are going full, full speed ahead. Uh, but, as we mentioned so many times before, the partnership future is uncertain if the level of cooperation with EU and the scope of achievements by the associate members as Ukraine and the partners is ignored. We believe that these achievements and progress should not be neglected or especially downplayed. Over the last 11 years, this initiative brought sizable benefits and we'd like to keep them close to our hearts, especially those ones we already achieved in political association, economic relations and regulatory convergence with the European Union. It is now clear that frameworks of this integration and fundamental transformation have been taking place in all the six states, but let me talk about Ukraine in particular. Uh, we believe that the EU's policy towards the Eastern Partnership, although this is the EU program, but in our view, should be progressive and forward-looking, uh, sort of positive approach. 
so that we will see the new strategic goals for the Eastern partners. And uh, what we see in Ukraine is the gradual access to the all four freedoms of the European Union. In this context, we actually regret that you rather pursue stock taking approach, which is not very ambitious and strategic enough into the conclusions. We hope that the conclusions by the end of the, of the formulation will be enhanced and we will see at least by the by the next summit that we already set a new agenda with a deeper integration for the partners with the European Union. I believe we will be able to agree on ambitious joint declaration that will satisfy all the parts. We also expect that common view on Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova will be uh, re sort of reviewed by the European Union. You remember that we came with, with the idea of enhanced dialogue with EU whatever the name is, plus reform at Troika, whatever the name, good name is. We are happy to cooperate in that and we believe that this is important for Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, that this instrument, neighborhood European instrument, is solid and separate and adequately financed and dedicated exclusively for the EU neighborhood. In this context, providing of a special financial instruments for three associate partners is more than welcome. We also need active financial support of you for a more reform agenda. It is here. We can discuss redirecting in the more, more important spheres, but at least what we see now that it helps to consolidate the forces behind these ideas within Ukrainian system. And I also see the same in Georgia and Moldova. It is also important to bring tangible benefits for the integration of our people. Some, we were very happy with visa-free regime. You know, we have this Russians are pushing this agenda that visa free regime now threatened because of virus. It is important for all of us to fight this, this disinformation, even in such a uh, narrow sphere as a visa liberalization. But we also talk about liberalizing, for example, the cell phones roaming tariffs. We've been talking so much about it. Some might believe that this is a very narrow issue, but that's what we believe can complement the visa, visa free uh, visits of Ukraine to Europe, to Europe, of Ukrainians to Europe. So they will see that they can come easily and can still be connected. And this connectivity is a very practical thing. Coming to the EIP priorities, uh, this is, I, I agree with Christian, this is extremely important to Ukraine that the security will stay on the top of the agenda. Up till now, the EU has been sort of focusing on the softer side of the security, mainly fighting corruption and supporting capacity building for the security sector. But what we're talking about when we talk about security, we're talking about military security. There are very practical things which can be done, like enhancing these regional offices of UM, for example, in Mariupol, and the number of mission mobile teams to, 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 to multiply. We remain interested in joint PASCO program. Once respective legal basis established, we allow to do so. On a more general note, we would appreciate if EU Parliament supports preparation of the joint declaration of summit based on common ownership and responsibility over Eastern Partnership. I hope that we can expect this support. I kindly thank for this for the support in advance and thank you for your attention. Ivana Klimpush Sinsadze, um, head of uh, European Integration Committee at Verkhovna Rada, at Ukrainian Parliament. Uh, Ivana, we are looking forward to your statement, but um, Vadim Prestaikos uh, uh, mentioned common view of uh, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. And um, we mentioned our speakers also mentioned uh, EU trio or um, associated countries, how we call them. And um, the question popped up actually to me, uh, which I would like to address to you. Uh, the question is about uh, if it's possible to push for um, new associated format uh, if there is no trust and if there is lack of trust between uh, Georgia, Moldova and, and Ukraine itself. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for initiating this um, discussion. I think it's very timely. I, I do. Uh, I want to to join all those uh, all that gratitude that was already voice towards Adrius Kubilius, to other uh, colleagues in the European Parliament who have joined this meeting and ha who have been um, actively promoting Ukraine's agenda uh, in the European Parliament and are doing so even in this challenging times. Uh, without your engagement and your support, colleagues, obviously Ukraine's voice would be much um, weaker in the in the European institutions. So thank you very much to all of you for what you are doing. Um, well, first of all, let me kind of touch upon the, the, the whole um, topic of this of this discussion. Uh, you see, I believe that um, over this decade that Ukraine has been part of the Eastern Partnership policy and um, it has benefited from it. But we have to understand that uh, since the association agreement um, um, signing and then um, coming into force, I think ratification coming into force, I think it has been uh, moved to a very uh, to a rather secondary and uh, the the um, Eastern Partnership uh, mechanism and instrument has been moved to secondary supplementary instrument in our relationship with the EU. And main um, uh, agenda is developed bilaterally, not multilaterally. However, uh, that, does, uh, that does not dismiss the um, possible revival and renewal of the Eastern Partnership uh, policy. But that has to be done um, with, um, I think, frankness um, to in, with all sides, both frankness in the EU, what do uh, European member, uh, EU member states, what do they expect from Eastern Partnership? How do they view the, their Eastern neighborhood? Do they have the ambitious agenda that they have to Western Balkans also towards at least those countries that have been clearly stating uh, their goals um, with regard to uh, European Union membership, uh, such as association countries. Um, and uh, that requires actually the answer to the question, well, what is Eastern Partnership to be in the nearest future? Whether it will have, you know, whether it will be, the, you know, a uh, platform for dialogue, uh, for talks, for communication, for engagement, whether it will be um, some sort of a security um, instrument, whether, um, for, uh, as you know, some might want to use it also as a, um, as a kind of um, area uh, that buffers the Russian, uh, Russian influence, even though, with, with, even though we hear that this is not an instrument targeted against any other country and so on. Or this, is, um, uh, this can be a tool or uh, is, should be a tool of um, uh, reaching membership for all those countries who actually want that membership, who have stated clearly their goals and uh, their ambition. And that's, um, that's with regard to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Well, and I think that it's important that um, in this renewed agenda for the Eastern Partnership that we uh, ensure that this differentiation that has been mentioned, that is even mentioned in some of the documents and the conclusions of the, of the Council, um, of, of the EU Council, does not stay on the declarative way, I th or on the declarative stage. I think um, it does require specific instruments, um, specific uh, mechanisms, how to ensure that a membership perspective is um, through sectoral integration, through different other um, ambitions that are coming into um, on the agenda today is, um, is achieved. If 10 years ago, for many of us, you know, signing and negotiating and signing of the association agreements was the goal or visa free was the goal, those goals are not anymore uh, on the table. And we have a pretty ambitious goals of, of membership perspective achievement. But so far, we do not see, um, you know, kind of clear um, identified mechanisms that will be included in the Eastern Partnership um, 
uh, towards towards reaching this um, this differentiation in facto uh, de facto not only um, you know in in uh, type of statements that are being done during the summits or during the agreed uh, with difficulty different uh, declarations with regard to your question Ilona um, obviously um, right now this is um, you know we see some of the frictions um, between Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova for a number of reasons. Um, however, up to date, all these countries, notwithstanding different um, disagreements, have been commonly pursuing their strategic goals in terms of um, EU association countries relationship. And the process of agreeing positions in the dialogue with the EU has started, I think, two, two and a half years ago at least, uh, when we started first um, speaking in one, in one voice with, the, with our European partners. And that has been bringing results. So yes, it's a difficult task for, I think, for the executive authorities today uh, to find, um, to kind of, um, revive that that uh, trust between the three countries that are association partners uh, but i think that this major goal that they have and major strategic uh, ambition that they have should be uh, kind of the common denominator between uh, with uh, under their activities also i think it's very important that eastern partnership is um um you know shows the commitment from both sides, from the EU and from the, um, from the association countries and uh, from the Eastern Partnership members, uh, member countries as such. Because if there is no commitment to, towards what we are uh, moving and what we do expect from this, if it's just a policy for the sake of being, a, for the sake of policy, for the sake of dialogue, then obviously the results will be also very ambiguous and we will not be, uh, you know, uh, successful in reaching results. And I think, um, just to round up, that pandemic right now has actually shown um, the necessity of cooperation with all, um, you know, for, for the EU, with all partners, not only with the financial instruments that the EU is stepping in. Um, I think it's also important with the, um, with much wi wider coordination and cooperation um, activities that are happening right now between uh, neighboring countries, not only in the Eastern neighborhood, but also in the South and, and, and uh, much wider between the EU and neighborhood uh, neighborhoods. So I think that Eastern uh, partnership countries could actually bring a lot also to the table, not only expect a lot. And I think that this, um, in this discussion, we still did not kind of touch upon the, uh, upon the uh, importance and upon, uh, upon the benefits that these, um, that our countries could actually bring to the EU. I, I totally believe that the EU cannot be successful without us. I do not see how the EU is uh, further building on prosperity, on security, on, on democracy, on, uh, on rule of law, on, uh, if it employs double standards towards um, um, countries of the Eastern neighborhood, for example, that we represent with our ambition, with our dedication, with our work and with our goals. So I think it's a two-way street and that's something that has been missing. But the two-way street also means two-way commitment. It's not only us making commitment to reform ourselves for, for our good, for our uh, for, for the benefit of our people, for the benefit of our societies, but also um, kind of expectation that um, there is no hesitation on behalf of the EU to actually um, open up the doors for those willing and working and delivering. Thank you, Ivana. Yes, I think it's very important to remember that Eastern Partnership Initiative is not only about six Eastern European countries, but it's also about the European Union itself, about its ability to project its influence and its transformative power. I think we should remember that while discussing this topic. Vadim Halaychuk, who is deputy uh, head of European Integration Committee. Uh, uh, Vadim, I don't see you actually, but um, I have a specific question to you as well. 
And as a representative of President Zelensky party, which is a ruling party of Ukraine, Sluha Narodu party. Uh, and my question is the following. Is the, US, is the European Union still the only model for Ukraine's development? Or uh, maybe some other alternatives uh, emerging? Hello, Leona. Hello, everyone. I can actually see you very well. Oh, yeah, yeah. You I see you now. <laughs> see me now and uh, hear me well. So many speakers, so sorry. Uh, well, yes. The, yes, I, I understand that. That's why I'm uh, just checking. Uh, happy to see everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And uh, this is a very interesting discussion. And uh, well, certainly, uh, we hope that it certainly will bring us closer to uh, understanding of uh, what's next on this very important issue of uh, Eastern Partnership. Uh, to uh, answer your question, Aliona, first is, uh, of course, I, I understand this, uh, this is um, sort of a provocative question uh, in light of, I guess, uh, many different statements from uh, many different members of the party made recently. However, the uh, uh, course of Ukraine that is fixed in the constitution of Ukraine towards the uh, Euro uh, European membership and NATO membership, uh, it's been made very clear by the pre President Zelensky that the course is unchanged. Uh, we only making it a more uh, ambitious goal of uh, uh, make it make it quicker, make it happen fast. Therefore, I can only agree with uh, my colleagues, my uh, previous speakers, that uh, uh, we certainly want to see. We see this as a uh, two-way street. Uh, we see how much Ukraine can do in terms of Europe's uh, security. Europe's uh, economy, uh, and we therefore hope that uh, this this will also intensify the process on the uh, uh, on the part of uh, EU member states countries to uh, be more willing to actually let that narrative about Ukraine's membership as the ultimate goal enter the uh, uh, discussions. I remember uh, when we were just elected the first visit to the European Parliament when we had a very uh, nice meeting with the group of European uh, parliamentarians, the Friends of Ukraine, where uh, one of the issues that, that we started discussing was that uh, uh, hey, we, we, we think we're uh, very capable of uh, making the process of uh, uh, joining the EU fast now that we have these great tools in our disposal, the uh, uh, mono majority uh, government president working towards the same goal. And uh, it was sort of a cold shower when uh, we were basically told that, look, it's actually better if we do not mention uh, membership for Ukraine in our official communications, because uh, that, that somehow, uh, some of the member states are very sensitive towards that. Well, anyway, uh, back to the Eastern uh, Partnership, as we celebrated the 10 years, we've uh, reflected on what's been done and how, uh, how it developed, what's, uh, uh, and of course, what's in the planning. And uh, as we remember, uh, back in 2008, when uh, Russia attacked Georgia, after that, a lot of processes, uh, political processes between EU and its uh, Eastern members uh, have intensified because of the security concerns. It became very obvious that uh, Russian policy uh, is quite aggressive. Therefore, EU needed a sort of policy that would uh, help uh, keep closer ties with, uh, with the Eastern members and uh, Eastern uh, countries uh, and uh, develop those uh, relationships so that the security questions, the economic uh, co uh, cooperation questions would uh, be easier to address. Um, Eastern, I agree that Eastern Partnership was a great tool in a lot of ways. Uh, for example, I remember how uh, the uh, visa-free travel negotiations intensified and even little things like the, the uh, getting of visa to EU countries 
uh, was simplified through creating different processes that, that allowed a lot of Ukrainians to uh, uh, get the visas quickly and to experience the, the travel and experience the uh, great European way of living, which helped a lot in terms of this people-to-people uh, -people uh, diplomacy. So that was, that was a great tool. Although I also remember how uh, after the initiative was formed, how some observers, how some experts and politicians have become a little concerned uh, whether the Eastern partnership is the sort of uh, deviation, sort of uh, attempt to replace the whole idea of Ukraine becoming the member of the European Union. And instead we were being pushed uh, aside sort of together with some other countries uh, to uh, basically uh, have, have us uh, occupy us with something else, something other than the uh, membership uh, sort of uh, um, way of joining the EU. Um, it's a great platform uh, to engage the, uh, the countries that, uh, that in the uh, Eastern uh, Partnership now. Uh, the uh, recent fight with the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how effective it can be, how we can quickly communicate, exchange experiences, exchange the knowledge, uh, and uh, also the, the financial and, and other assistance uh, comes, uh, uh, comes quicker, comes uh, in a more effective way. Uh, but now that we're discussing the lessons of the Eastern Partnership and the plans for the future, and we hear different initiatives, for example, the, the Trio Plus initiative, uh, we reflecting on the previous experiences, of course, we want to hear more on how it could function, uh, what new tools are going to be available. We understand the differences between the, the, the countries, between the three countries that, are, uh, that, that we think are uh, much better prepared to move forward. We understand uh, that the countries who have already signed the association agreements and, uh, and the free trade agreements uh, are in a very different stage of uh, uh, development in terms of the relationships with the European Union than the countries who, uh, let's be frank, have been working uh, pretty, uh, pretty steadily on deepening the ties with Russia. Uh, so that, that, that is certainly uh, has to be taken into account. However, uh, we still do not hear enough details in terms of how this would be managed. And, and what new is, is going to be uh, used in terms of making this, uh, this cooperation more effective. Uh, also important how, uh, how the other three countries look at it. I mean, it's our neighbors. We have, uh, we have relationships, we have economic ties to these countries. We, it is important to develop them. And of course, we, uh, we understand it's important to uh, have good relationships in, in all uh, with all six countries uh, with the European Union. So those issues would have to be addressed in, in a lot more details than, than they were now uh, in order for us to uh, uh, be certain about the strategic uh, uh, way and, and a strategic necessity to form that, that trio in, the, uh, in that form and shape that, that is proposed that has been uh, discussed uh, recently. And of course, the, uh, the, the goals, the uh, uh, immediate goals, the, the focus that we're trying to make now uh, is on uh, cooperation in different sectors. We see a lot of opportunities and uh, some previous speakers have mentioned the, the dig digital market opportunities that are opening up. Uh, and I totally agree with uh, remarks that uh, on the security issue, for example, when, uh, when we're discussing the security cooperation with the EU, uh, the security, the cybersecurity cooperation is of great importance. We see how much is going on in that field and, and how much expertise has been developed by, by the EU and shared with Ukraine and how much Ukraine can in turn with this, with, with our IT sector being uh, very developed and, and some very interesting projects coming up. Uh, it, it could be again, one of those great examples of uh, cooperation, of, of mutually beneficial cooperation that we hope we're gonna be uh, focusing, uh, focusing on. So uh, we 
as, as a representative of the party that is the uh, uh, party in power, uh, again, let me assure everyone that we certainly see no uh, possibility to change the course and uh, don't even consider any other options or models as, as any uh, plausible workable models. Uh, the uh, association, we realize that progress uh, uh, in our performance on association agreement was uh, less than what we expected, quite frankly. However, the, the reasons for that, uh, for that are many and, and we can, that's a totally separate issue. Uh, but those initiatives to uh, form a uh, uh, workable uh, roadmap uh, to prioritize the uh, uh, issues on, uh, on uh, approximation of Ukrainian legislation, uh, to intensify the negotiations on changing the, uh, on making the necessary changes and amendments to the association agreement uh, that, are, that are right, and those negotiations are underway. Uh, just confirming what I already said, we are directly set on uh, pursuing uh, full membership in the European Union. And uh, that is the strategic course for the uh, Sluha Narodu, the servant of the People Party. Thank you. Thank you, Vadim. Uh, I heard that Ivana uh, has to leave us. Yes, Ivana? I will have to leave at 6. At that's uh, Ukrainian time. That's the, the latest, like 5.50. So okay, I, okay. So anyway, I, I would suggest to collect a couple of questions. From, uh, from the participants, uh, especially to Ivana, and to, there are some questions also to Mr. Danielson. So uh, I have a question from um, Vladislav Maximum, who is uh, a Euroactive journalist. And uh, he has a question to Mr. Danielson. Uh, the question is the following. Uh, Deputy, Pre uh, Deputy Prime Minister Vadim Prestaiko recently said in an interview that Ukraine will seek a revision of the EU-Ukraine agreement, um, association agreement, uh, in terms of uh, quotas, as well as continue to pursue its goal of reaching an industrial visa-free regime that is an ACA with the EU. Representatives of the EU institutions have previously expressed skepticism as to whether he, this should be a priority. Do you believe that the revision of quotas is realistic within the context of COVID-19 recovery? And is it an opportunity, uh, um, opportunity time to be making this part of negotiations? So that was a question to Mr. Danielson. And question to Ivana Klimpushtsensadze from Dmitrosh Kurko, a national news agency of Ukraine, Brussels correspondent. Um, you are representing a democratic opposition in Ukrainian parliament, keeping in mind all recent developments, including attempts of the legal prosecution against the key opposition politicians. Is it still possible to create a unity in U Ukrainian parliament around efforts on European integration agenda? Is there a unity among democratic forces in Rada around keeping EU and NATO membership prospective? Shall, shall I start? Is that? Yeah, 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 please, please. Okay, fine. Uh, now, um, I think the way we, I mean, we are two parties, and of course, Ukraine is one of the parties to the association agreement and is fully free to, to show ambition and willingness to, to, uh, to drive the cooperation forward. I think our line on this is that, as it stands today, there is scope and substantial scope within the existing association agreement for us to work on. And, and I think our advice would be that's where we should put the efforts. And I mentioned ACA as one element of that in that context. I think we also need to look on the telecommunication side where the whole issue of digital and digital, the, the sort of how we can clo become closer to each other, we should look into. And there are various stuff also when it comes to issues relating to customs, which are essential for our trade relationship. So I think we feel that let's now focus on that and see to that we get that one moving forward together with a number of other issues that are also 
there under the association agreement. So that's more our view on it. When it comes to the quotas, uh, that is on agricultural products. I don't think we have quotas, but Vadim, you have to correct me, but I don't think we have quotas outside the field of agriculture. And uh, there my advice would probably be to see to that we use the quotas that we have to its utmost. My understanding is that there are quotas that has not been filled. Uh, I don't see uh, great enthusiasm on the EU side to start discussions on quotas as it stands today, to be honest. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for for outlining that we are in the, uh, that I represent a democratic opposition. I think my colleague uh, Vadim will uh, actually confirm that all those uh, issues uh, that have been important for European and Euro Atlantic integration and that have been put uh, on the agenda in the Ukrainian Parliament, uh, they are exactly were. Uh, vo votes were not enough from the mono majority it's um, european solidarity that stepped in uh, in order to uh, ensure that we are not losing the course uh, we will continue to support um, the european and euro atlantic um, initiatives or that 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 are driving uh, the country closer to the eu and to the strategic goals that are uh, outlined in the um, in the constitution um, however, obviously, we will be also ringing bells with regard to our concern, with regard to, to the um, cracks in the um, in this it, in ensuring that rule of law is um, the guiding principle for for our country, uh, and also in ensuring uh, that uh, political persecution is not taking uh, taking place. We will be ringing uh, and drawing attention, as we have done so before, of our colleagues in the European Parliament and in the European Commission and other institutions to um, attempts to actually um, drive back some of the reform agenda that has uh, that has been happening i think some of the mistakes have already been understood by our colleagues from the mono majority and uh, some of the criticisms that we we've, we've been voicing earlier back uh, in october or in september uh, of 2019 have actually now received support both from the constitutional court of ukraine and from our partners uh, from like venice commission and that's for example with regard to the judicial reform so-called judicial reform that has been initiated by the mono majority so i hope that the parliament by coming in full speed um to um usual uh, working regime will actually be dealing with those issues that have already caused some uh, some problems and that uh, have uh, backslided some of the uh, reforms that have been achieved up to date, actually including um, some of the steps that have been uh, taken by the parliament yesterday with regard to um, anti-corruption reform and with regard to um, narrowing narrowing the, the scope of uh, declaration for uh, for some, uh, for some of the members of the family, uh, families of those who are supposed to declare um, uh, their uh, to, to the, the declare their financial resources and material resources. So we hope that we will work together with our partners, both inside of the majority and uh, also with our European partners who understand the risks of uh, backsliding with the reforms. Okay, we will have more Q&A, um, more time for Q&A session later. Uh, and now I would suggest to move um, to expert discussion. Uh, Hanna Hupko, uh, who is the chairwoman of uh, Zero Corruption Conference, co-organizer of today's event, and also former head of um, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Hanna, what is your take on what is going on around Eastern Partnership Initiative? And um, is there any plan B for Ukraine if uh, the Eastern Partnership doesn't uh, raise our expectations? Just a second. Um. 
I thought, oh, sorry. Now I'm on, yeah. Thanks, Alona. Of course, uh, there is uh, just uh, one plan and it's uh, plan B, uh, if you mean uh, bilateral re relations with the EU. So, of course, we have incorporated into our constitution, our strategic goal to become members uh, of NATO and the EU. So, I think uh, the successes of uh, three associated countries, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, with an Eastern partnership and with the future membership perspectives, could become, uh, could have uh, the major positive impact on the geopolitical uh, development on the whole continent of Europe. And in a long-term perspective, it will also positively influence similar transformation even in Russia. Uh, of course, uh, we civil society, government officials, uh, representatives of Verkhovna Rada uh, today, and it's really a, a big pleasure to have members of European Parliament, besides um, Andrius Kubilius, uh, also Michael Haller, Miriam Lexman, and Viola von Kramer, and others. Uh, I also would like to express our gratitude uh, to uh, Mr. Danielson and Katerina Maternova, who are working uh, on uh, uh, making Ukraine more uh, prosperous, more successful with uh, strong democracy and rule of law. First of all, I would like to say that uh, we uh, consider 2020 with upcoming Eastern Partnership Summit, Ukraine-EU Summit, German EU presidency as a good opportunity to um, emphasize identification of Ukraine's leadership and strategic ambition to join the EU. As I mentioned, it's incorporated into our constitution with effective association agreement implementation framework in place. So I think um, readiness to take, uh, we express our readiness to take the lead in trio format negotiations uh, within the Eastern Partnership initiatives. And uh, also since the world uh, this year First, uh, uh, in 2020, UN will mark its 75th anniversary. Then just uh, a week ago, uh, we commemorated the victims of the Second World War. And of course, there is no Soviet Union, and there is no Stalinism, but there is Putinism. And I think that successful Ukraine could become a powerful tool for transformation in our aggressive neighbor, Russian Federation. And uh, there could be many excuses or double approaches, double standards, uh, why um, uh, accession strategy, uh, the, uh, using the EU uh, Balkan strategy, and uh, now we are observing integration, and we are really very happy for uh, such countries of uh, Western Balkans like North Macedonia and Albania, uh, moving towards uh, EU membership perspective and also we are very happy that North Macedonia recently uh, joined to NATO uh, and uh, we think that now the European Union should define its own strategy towards Russian Federation, it's to become more ambition uh, to, uh, towards Eastern uh, partnership, of course more engagement needed. We have to express ambition to become a regional investment hub, uh, calling for establishment of Eastern uh, European uh, Partnership investment platform. Uh, again, EU plus three dialogue on economic and investment cooperation, on the dialogue on DCFTA, access to the EU single market, lower roaming tariffs. So it's clear, it's all these instruments which are needed uh, but on uh, three or four months, uh, I think that it's really also important if it's possibly also come back to the idea of extending uh, uh, support group format to all three countries. Um, let's at least test the water with such a proposal. And um, today we are having this discussion. We, of course, expected to uh, conduct our zero corruption conference. Uh, uh, as an international forum linking corruption and money laundering with global security environment, energy and public health issues this April, but due to the COVID-19, we postponed it until still uh, unclear when, autumn or next year. So I think uh, the goal was uh, and is to shape a new agenda 
aim at reaching a future with zero corruption, because Dan Mr. Danielson mentioned important um, importance uh, for the EU to see the progress on anti-corruption in Ukraine, decentralization reform, judiciary reform. So civil society are working hard on making pressure on current government and mono majority to implement uh, started after the dignity revolution reforms, especially on decentralization. Uh, our NGO uh, from May started a big project community advocates with the focus to implement uh, decentralization reform and before local elections with the support of EED. But uh, what I would like also to mention that we have to be uh, as a community representatives of the European continent more ambitious. And of course, um, analyzing the Western Balkans uh, EU uh, um, uh, strategy, uh, we have here also some, not, not, not like jealousness, but uh, really we would like to see one day that EU uh, potent, uh, propose, uh, should grant EU potential candidate status, uh, candidate status for U Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova. And uh, uh, who knows, uh, maybe, uh, in 2027, when uh, Lithuanian EU presidency will be, or uh, um, later, we could uh, reach um, uh, to this uh, EU, uh, can, um, uh, EU candidate status with the roadmap and clear, indica clear um, indications and KPIs. Why it's really important? Because sometimes we are hearing uh, some uh, explanations that look, um, in Ukraine, the progress of reform uh, reforms are not so enough. Are not enough. So uh, you should speed up your reform process. Of course, it's clear. But from geopolitical perspectives, and if we are looking into the future in ten years ahead of us, so we should analyze what happened in 2008 after the NATO Bucharest summit. Then, when uh, in 2009, when the Eastern uh, European um, EAP was uh, as an initiative was launched as a strategic partnership tool, but for Ukraine now it's more important to talk uh, not about partnership but uh, about future perspective on membership, and it will also help help to mobilize the political will within Ukrainian political elites, which are. Uh, really differ, very different and some sort of unique. And I think uh, it's, uh, if we are thinking about the future of uh, European continent, I think the uh, proposal from EU side to Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova uh, should be more ambitious. And um, because 2020 deliverables, which was discussed, it was a good instrument but not enough and also well criticized in Ukraine. So to um, conclude, I could say that uh, it's really um, important to help uh, those people who are fighting uh, in Russian Federation against repressions like national minorities, indigenous peoples living in different republics by showing strong support to uh, Russian, Russian neighbors like Ukraine Georgia and Moldova, and the next expert will focus on uh, national security issues, uh, which is really important because Ukraine became a contributor of European security. Uh, uh, and I think it's really important. So I hope that uh, uh, more geopolitical will on behalf of EU uh, towards uh, to Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, this is what we need, and it will keep Ukrainian political elites and the most important society more motivated as what we've seen with uh, visa-free regime, with association agreement. And uh, if we want to avoid new military conflicts, uh, we have to think about more ambitious goal and how to be more united, more consolidated. And uh, I think that uh, this is um, what is achievable and Ukraine as a member of the EU and NATO definitely uh, will um, all this uh, uh, alliance and the EU community will benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I would like to pass the floor to another civil society leader, Daria Kaliniuk, who is the head of um, 
Anti-Corruption Action Center. And uh, to follow up um, a reforms topic or reforms agenda topic, uh, Daria, maybe the problem with Eastern Partnership upgrading lies in Kiev, not in Brussels. Maybe uh, we should be more uh, effective in implementing our reform agenda. And then we'll, we will be rewarded accordingly. How do you assess current progress uh, on the reforms? In Thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Alona. I think uh, you were right that it's actually movement towards both sides. And while we are discussing here the possibility to integrate Ukraine into the European Union and fear within the European Union to even discuss that, uh, I would like to say that Ukrainian dirty money is already integrated in the European Union. And places like Cyprus, for example, um, they are receiving this money. And um, Kubidus at the beginning applauded to um, Ukrainian Parliament for adoption of the anti kalamoisky law. It is a big success. We were fighting hard for this law. Uh, however, we should not forget that at least $2 billion from the Privat Bank, which belonged to Kolomoisky, were laundered through the Privat Bank branch in Cyprus. And Cyprus regulators didn't see for decades any violation of anti-money laundering rules which exist in the European Union. So there are things which have to be also approved in terms of fight with, with dirty money into the European Union. And I think here, the cooperation with Ukraine and with newly established Ukrainian structures which show results can be very beneficial. And I would want to emphasize that when we had uh, an ambitious and measurable thing like with a liber liberalization action plan, we were able to achieve some miracles here in Ukraine in terms of building strong institutions and in terms of good governance. And Ivana will probably confirm here that it was, uh, um, it was not easy to cooperate with uh, uh, civil society uh, during the previous um, administration, but we were pushing jointly together with the EU and civil society for the reforms like establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, which is working, which is operating, and which is now pursuing very hard cases, like the establishment of the electronic system of asset declarations. It's impossible to imagine such system in, in the European Union. It's now promoted by the World Bank as one of the you know, best solutions for the, public, uh, for, for the asset declarations of public officials. And it provides us and provides financial institutions ways to control the funding and the assets of uh, public officials. So uh, within the European Union, uh, there is, um, let's say, the new anti-money laundering um, uh, directive introduced. Uh, beneficial public registry of beneficial companies have to be created, but you know I know just probably one or two countries uh, where they are publicly accessible. Um, I would want to say that um, when we had this visa liberalization action plan, uh, we were able to use it as a huge leverage um, to make our government to the leader. Now we don't have this leverage with this new government. And um, honestly, nowadays, I'm very pessimistic uh, with the new government. We had much hopes at the beginning. There was a honeymoon. Uh, there were some uh, measurable achievements. But those reformers who brought these achievements are now out of the, of, of the government. and. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, Ruslan Rebashapka, who was sacked. The new Prosecutor General is fully incompetent and loyal to authorities. She's not independent and she's blocking the continuation of the prosecution reform. Uh, we were actually happy with the movement of President Zelensky with judicial reform, but it is blocked. It is blocked by the Supreme, um, by High Council of Justice. And the new law has to be to, um, to to, to unblock this, this reform. And um, we are talking here about 
new green deal and importance of, um, of, of delivering new green economy and that it is it has to be something in the heart of the Eastern Partnership. But just yesterday, the head of the state environmental inspection, who actually delivered results and started sanctioning the top polluters of Ukrainian air, was sucked from government. And I'm talking about Yegor Pearson. Um, so while we really truly celebrated the success story yesterday, the anti Kalamoyski law, and we hope that it will fully unblock the cooperation with the IMF. Uh, we are now in a very um, tough mode with uh, new Ukrainian leadership. There are no excuses now, and uh, we are now, a, as civil society, in a watchdog move, in, in, in a watchdog um, uh, mode. Um, we believe that uh, Ukrainian current leadership, President Zelensky and the government of Ukraine, um, can deliver much more. And we are very unhappy that the best of the best people, true reformers, like, let's say, Maxim Nifeodov, the, uh, the, the creator of Prozoro public procurement system, which is also unbelievably progressive. And uh, we are now exporting this system to Sweden, to the EU. But, uh, you know, the creator of this system, Maxim Nifeodov, was sacked two, two, two weeks ago. And the new Minister of Economy, who is linked to oligarch Bakhmatuk, is saying, it's a strange system. You know, it's, uh, I think this um, current political leadership uh, have to realize um, that um, they are not forever um, in, in power. Um, and most likely there will be more tough and tough, uh, more tougher, um, relationships between civil society in Ukraine and between um, uh, current leadership. We will be more and more critical. However, I fully agree here with Hannah Hapko that we, are we should be talking here about a strategy for 10 years, not one year. Ukraine will be for a long time and Ukrainian people already voted for the European Union and for the European future of Ukraine and we are paying very hard price and people are dying and we're dying and still dying in this war uh, on Donbass and I think that there will come time where Ukra Ukrainian leadership will be more committed and strong on, the, on, on reforms, on all reforms including good governance and, 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 and uh, green energy uh, and everything which is listed in EU association agreement. So, but we have to be prepared for this time. And I hope that the EU will open door for, 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 for Ukraine as a leader for the entire region. Um, uh, and we will be uh, all together prepared for that moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Your message is clear. Uh, and to the last um, expert in our expert part of discussion, Olena Snihir. Uh, Olena, uh, what yes. actually argument could you provide to those member states, EU member states, who don't like the idea to include security component in Eastern Partnership uh, a new policy? Well, hi everyone. Thank you, Alena, for such a, a question, tricky question. Uh, still, it's interesting. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting discussion and for the chance to be part of this discussion. Uh, well, uh, about arguments, we uh, all uh, have the feeling that uh, Eastern Partnership needs to be updated today to the current security situation uh, because uh, uh, Eastern Partnership was uh, aimed at the beginning to make Eastern neighborhood more secure for European Union. And it was designed also to comfort Russian Federation at that time. Has Eastern Partnership achieved these two goals? Uh, Russian Federation is definitely comforted uh, with a such process oriented, but not goal oriented uh, initiative or policy of European Union in Eastern neighborhood and in Eastern Europe and in South Caucasus. Has uh, Eastern uh, European region uh, became more secure for European Union? Uh, definitely not. Eastern partnership can be a success story for common foreign and security policy of uh, European Union in Eastern Europe if it is redesigned. Uh, in a goal-oriented regional initiative, uh, 
such a, for example, such a policy European Union has in Western Balkans. It was mentioned already today. Otherwise, European uh, Eastern Partnership countries uh, in Ukraine uh, also will continue to enjoy more fruitful cooperation with EU on bilateral level. So it's the question for EU. Um, does EU want a more effective regional policy in its na eastern neighborhood? More effective and more uh, productive and more fruitful. Um, well, EU security approaches today in Eastern Partnership region is characterized by two uh, factors. It's first is distancing from conflict resolution strategy and second, emphasizing soft power instruments and resilience strengthening strategy. But soft power approach cannot go alone. Uh, the soft power approach can be effective in combination with more substantial and result-oriented defense and military cooperation. And uh, uh, you should consider opening of new formats and programs with Eastern Partnership countries in defense and military sphere, especially taking into account successful example of military cooperation between European Union and Ukraine in the sphere of common security and defense policy. Uh, what can uh, be the recommendations for uh, European Union to enhance the Eastern Partnership Initiative? First, it is necessary to include uh, common security and defense policy practices into Eastern Partnership policy. Eastern Partnership is a part of common foreign security policy. Without defense and security, it is not effective in the current period of time. Soft power policy is not effective if there is lack of basic security conditions. There should be accepted differentiated approach to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova in the frames of Eastern Partnership, also in order not to lose the achieved progress, but to defend and uh, foster further transformations. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova's Eastern Partnership countries face the same threats and already have got experience of resistance. It would be logical to institutionalize the process of sharing experience of the three countries among each other and uh, with EU. Also, it is necessary to enhance uh, the mandate of EU's missions, especially in Ukraine and Georgia. And the special focus uh, today should be given to the security of maritime trade roads in the Black Sea, uh, where European, in European Union is de facto absent, even with its, its soft power instruments though it is also the territory of European Union interests and European Union members are present there. That's all from me. Thank you, Olena. Let's move to um, discussion with members of uh, European Parliament. And we are happy to uh, have today um, um, members of European Parliament, some members of European Parliament, I would say that with strong German accent, um, because uh, we are having a, a viola von Kramon um, and uh, Michael Galle. Um, and uh, I would invite, I would invite, I think, uh, viola first for uh, intervention up to four minutes, uh, maybe some um, ideas, conclusions from today's discussion or um, remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Aliena. Thank you uh, to all the organizers. Uh, I think that was a very, very interesting and very, as you said, timely uh, discussion. Um, I could easily connect where Daria actually has stopped. Uh, since I'm involved in Ukraine issues for almost 25 years now, I'm a little bit sick and tired to listen to all these arguments from for some of the, uh, let's say, representatives again and again. I think uh, people in Ukraine have deserved uh, a better governance. They have deserved good governance and they have deserved uh, let's say, uh, let's say a more energetic um, fight against corruption. Everything which was mentioned by Mr. Danielson, I fully agree, but I wish we would be much more conditioned 
on these issues. What you have mentioned is absolutely right. The uh, um, reform on, on public administration, decentralization is for sure a big success. You haven't mentioned the health reform because most of the money came from the US or Japan or, or other countries, but nevertheless, it is in our interest to improve the situation on the ground for the people in Ukraine and therefore the health reform is also as the decentralization uh, uh, reform of, uh, of a big, um, uh, at most important. So uh, what um, Ivana Klimpush had mentioned, the sectoral integration, I think is absolutely right. Therefore, the energy reform is also, uh, or would be also of a big progress. Um, and when I see now, let's say the reluctance of uh, the head of the committee in the Vahovna Rada, to go ahead with a more ambitious uh, uh, reform on renewables on the other side, on the contrary, uh, give more uh, influence to the oligarchs in, 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 in terms of uh, energy influence. And I have read today the interview or the article about the dismissal of Mr. Vitrenko. I'm not completely sure what is behind this, but of course, what he has said about the situation in Naftogaz, uh, obviously, there are some corruption issues as well. And uh, so I see this is a big backlash and, and many parts what Mr. Danielson has mentioned uh, instead of progress. So when it comes to Eastern partnership, I think we have to really look very, very carefully where we are in Ukraine. And I wish we could have a much more positive outlook for a 10 year strategy. Um, and also, I mean, people talking about uh, the, the summit and the Zagreb summit and the positive outlook for uh, the Western Balkan state. And I've just read one of the questions they are working on enlargement, working on uh, uh, Western Balkan state and being the standing rapporteur on Kosovo. People are there highly frustrated about <laughs> the non-perspective uh, for most of the countries uh, in, let's say, the midterm uh, um, midterm perspective. Uh, so I wish we could see in Ukraine from the domestic issue a much more ambitious uh, strategy, a much more ambitious reform agenda, which then could be echoed by the European Union. And I guess we are all ready to do so. There's a lot of money going into Ukraine. And uh, as I said, I, I, I see uh, reform steps. I see in, in terms of decentralization, uh, somebody has mentioned, for example, also the security question. Um, I guess we have to work and to strengthen much more this uh, security question. I see this as a big, um, um, let's say, reluctance in some of the member states, and we are not happy with this. But when we talk about the trio strategy, that means we take three countries out of the Eastern Partnership concept and we leave three one behind, Russia will be very happy to take over. So I would really ask us and really uh, think about twice uh, taking it apart and giving three countries a more advanced chance to be first integrated in the European Union than having all six of them together because Russia is just looking for this little uh, hook to enter uh, at least, I mean, Belarus, it's very obvious, but also Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I think we have a responsibility to go along as much as we can with all six countries, uh, but at the same time, really pressuring for more and real and honest uh, reforms, which were all being mentioned and where I do see a lot of, um, uh, unclearancy and not really uh, the approach we were hoping as as Daria said at the beginning as a honeymoon and and really this speed and this rapid uh, reform uh, uh, um, tempo what what was announced by Zelensky when he was um, uh, applying for um, uh, the presidency so Overall, I am still very positive and I'm still very optimistic, but with uh, some new appointments in the government and also in some agency and Riva Shapka as a general prosecutor was dismissed, Maxim was already mentioned, Vitrenko and many other reformers are now sacked. 
this is not the right signal to give to us as the European Union, as one of the bigger um, donators and also one of these um, uh, supporters for a more ambitious uh, reform um, um, again, agenda. This would be my very brief um, intervention. Thank you. Mr. Galler, what is your take? Well, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes. Good, Perfect. wonderful. So, uh, first of all, most of what has been said, uh, I, I would definitely subscribe. However, um, uh, Viola, I wouldn't artificially uh, uh, try to, to get uh, what, you, what we have with the three more ambitious ones and the three less ambitious ones. It is one framework indeed, but uh, I mean, if we see that there are three who have more ambitions and the, others, uh, the other three for their specific reasons do not want to follow, it's not us from our side who would uh, then uh, divide it, uh, but it's, it's uh, the three ones who are not as ambitious as the other ones who are uh, setting themselves apart. I mean, they could at any point join a more ambitious agenda. We are not closing it with when we argue about uh, this, this trio that we have got there. But on all the other things, I would really uh, like uh, to, to subscribe what has been said. When it is about this basic question, is it a sidetrack, this Eastern partnership? If it were that it were a sidetrack, I do not think that we would invest uh, in Ukraine, the amount of money. This is the country that get most uh, support financially from that is outside the European Union. You, so you are the first outside the Union. And if that were a sidetrack, we would certainly not invest so much in the sidetrack. In my mind, as long as the agenda that is currently existing with the association agreement and DCFTA implementation that is something that in each regard gets you closer to us, regardless you have, whether you have already the next uh, uh, commitment from our side, which would be a formal uh, uh, candidate for a date or whatever uh, uh, candidate with regard to candidate status. Uh, you are fully on track. Everything that you are doing in the current agenda that we have was to be be done and was done by all those who at some stage were already candidates. So nothing that you are pursuing, and hopefully you are, uh, is something that gets you off a track that you definitely would like to follow. And you have supporters uh, inside the European Union for that. And as I said in earlier meetings, you do not need a formalized status if you do your job, if you do the homework. Turkey, with all its formalized status as a candidate that is negotiating, is further away from the European today than from the Union than it was 10 years ago. So uh, a formal status can change and doesn't mean anything. But a uh, delivered job on all the issues that have been addressed, uh, uh, that is something that gets you de facto closer and, in, uh, and the, f uh, the more you implement, the more we can discuss about additional steps, additional programs, additional policy fields where we can uh, upgrade our, um, our um, uh, cooperation. I'm coming also from security and defense issues. I'm very much in favor to do as much as possible in whatever framework, be it the NATO framework or the EU framework, to get you closer in this regard uh, uh, as well. So that is not the, uh, there's not the point, and there are possibilities uh, uh, to do that. But as we speak, uh, I'm, I share a bit the concern, and we have had other setups of members of the Verhovna Rada, uh, where there has been very uh, pessimistic outlook uh, uh, on the reform process. Coming, for instance, to the health reform. I mean, of course, this COVID crisis is a, is a huge challenge for all of us, for all of our systems. But certainly, I would clearly say, uh, uh, with uh, your uh, uh, current reform, the, the second stage that started on the 1st of April, which uh, made it clear for at least two thirds of the hospitals that they are in a better uh, situation now. For the others, you should not discuss about uh, mere closure. It's not only about open or closure. It is also about converting it to other parts of the health system. These are very 
concrete things that can be done. And uh, um, I would, uh, what, but what I see, and that is my concern, that with the best intentions, the president on his side, with the best intentions, although most of those who have been newly elected and who are not on a different payroll, but who are on, so to say, on their own engagement on the reform track, I, I see in the health reform, uh, my impression is that the president does not directly talk with the National Health Service people who know what it's all about, but there's always this, this, corona, this corona around him, so to say, his entourage who have, in my mind, a, a different agenda. And it's, it is, it's about these concerns that we have, that even with the best intentions, when the wrong people are at the wrong places uh, and blocking the real dialogue that is necessary, I'm only taking this example, there are others, uh, then we will not uh, uh, proceed. So uh, rest assured, regardless who is in government and in opposition, we have an agreed agenda and we pursue it from our side and we take all real reformers uh, together and we should uh, join forces and, and uh, obstruct all those who pretend to be reformers but who have a different agenda. If we do that and if we succeed and if the people see, the people, the normal people in their daily lives, there is a change. And I think in the health sector, for instance, there is a change on the lowest level when it is the doctors where they go and that the money follows patient principles, such things are very concrete. And then there is less corruption possible if the real structure, the right structures are set up. So this is uh, uh, where we stand and uh, where we want to join with everybody who, who, who really means it uh, with pursuing the reform track. Thank you. Thank you. And our final intervention is um, from uh, Mykola Pichitsky, who is Ukraine's ambassador to the European Union. Uh, I would like you, uh, I would like to ask um, you, Ambassador, to uh, maybe draw some conclusions from today's discussions. We, unfortunately, we have only six minutes left and um, you have four minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Aluna. Sorry, I, I cannot uh, open my camera, but in any case, uh, before I will concentrate my comments on, on three elements which you uh, already tried to ask uh, the whole panelists. I would like to thank you, uh, Aluna, as, especially dear Mr. Kubilius, uh, Anna Hopko, to organize, to organize such an event because it's really very timely. Uh, second, uh, since we are talking about Eastern Partnership uh, and uh, uh, we have here uh, Mr. Danielson, I would like to thank uh, EU for to be with us during the whole this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I just would like to remember that uh, 1.2 billion of uh, euro, it's about Eastern Partnership money. And uh, this is, was not a, a very easy decision. And I, I thank you, European Commission, for such a support. And of course, uh, it was very, uh, how to say, timely. Uh, to, to join, to connect Ukraine to uh, health, uh, security, uh, health Security Committee uh, as an observer, of course, but uh, we will appreciate uh, this cooperation. Uh, now about three elements which I consider uh, should uh, be a little bit highlighted. Uh, upgrade, update, as Alona asked, and also uh, divide uh, partners. Look, uh, we... Uh, as six of us, I mean Ukraine and other six of us, we are talking about, uh, you know, up, upgrade and, and update. What, what I mean, first, uh, uh, Ivana, uh, two Vadims, uh, Anna, they remember very well that how it was difficult two, two years ago to talk about digital roaming, uh, market security, and I will continue. Or I can continue, sorry. But now uh, we are talking about those elements in Eastern Partnership. So we are not jaloux so far. We provide uh, the, how to say, uh, our success to our uh, partners. So we are not divided. We, are, we, will we will never divide each other because, you know, it's about a partnership. Second, 
uh, we uh, consider um, this uh, mechanism as an additional one, and we will consider this as an additional one. And um, when we are talking about trio, uh, this is uh, about you know this philosophy more for more. Uh, it means that it's not only interesting for you to have three of us which more uh, performant, I mean, in, uh, in cooperation with the EU, but also uh, to cooperate between three of us, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. We also uh, had yesterday a conversation with our fourth partner, Guam, uh, Azerbaijan, which also helped a lot to, to Ukraine in some kind of element. So, look, when we are talking Eastern partnership, this is not only about a, how to say, a one year strategy. It's a long one. That's why um, Ukraine from the beginning uh, announced to be uh, interesting to have this Green Deal issue in our Eastern bilateral and Eastern partnership uh, cooperation. Second, when we are talking about uh, upgrade, we would like to have, you know, uh, to be invited uh, uh, as a you know, partners to participate in uh, ministerial level together with the EU. We would like to have a, a, as ambassador to be present in some, uh, how to say, um, meetings of COEST or CORREPER. Uh, so, look, the goal is of this meeting and each of meeting where, where we're talking about uh, Eastern Partnership to upgrade and to update and to, you know, to do our cooperation better. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Kubilius, Mr. Prestaiko, uh, do you have any concluding remarks? One minute remarks? I will try. Uh, thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks a lot, Alona, really. It's, it's Hannah. It's, it's, it's really a very, very good event, I would say. Uh, my very simple conclusion is just two moments. One, of course, I will react to Viola on TRIO, <laughs> and my message is very simple. Ukraine cannot wait when Belarus will decide do they want to come you know, uh, closer to Europe as, as Ukraine wants. So that's, that's for sure. And uh, if we shall not make uh, real differentiation, uh, then really I am afraid that EAP is some partnership as a policy in some way really will go will go very heavily down. Armenians want to join TRIO. That's exactly what we wanted to 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 see, you know, that uh, countries should, you know, see possibility and should compete. And then my last point, exactly on Ontario. You're absolutely right. I'm always talking that, you know, what and even from the Lithuanian experience, we quite recently we went through all the integration process. And what really works is exactly, you know, carrot and stick. Very clear, you know, goals which countries can achieve. And that, that brings exactly this leverage which, you know, uh, is, is allowing to push, you know, uh, civil society, the governments for, for reforms. That was with, with the free, that was with association agreement. You as a civil society did a great job, you know, pushing, pushing the government to make reforms because really, the government also understood that people want to achieve that, that goal, very practical goal. Now, unfortunately, we are not able to provide anything of the same significance you know, uh, to, to, to Ukraine, to other, other trio countries. And that is where really uh, it will not be enough uh, uh, to put uh, as, as, as a goal something, you know, small things. We need to look what kind of, you know, much bigger, much ambitious uh, instruments we can implement from EU side in order really to create the same the same motivation to continue with the reforms on your side and to and to give you some kind of instruments really to push the government to make reforms we need to be realistic not all the governments uh, are always very reformist it goes you know from uh, more reformists to less reformists and again you know uh, reformists are coming back. That was that was the same in Lithuania. We need to be, you know, always, always very, very persistent in pushing, pushing forward. And uh, I hope that at the end, you know, this decade really will be very, very effective in in pushing uh, Ukraine, especially Ukraine, much closer to Europe. Thank you, Mr. Prestaiko. Thank you, thank you, Leona. Thank you to everybody. Uh, 
you know, the, my problem is here that we are again talking in a very close sort of circle of people who understand each other. I'm missing uh, the good, good uh, ideological fight. Uh, we had this discussion and we've been having this discussion for quite a while. We don't understand the importance of Eastern partnership. Ukraine was bringing the arguments that we are rather pursuing our bilateral agenda with European Union, which is rather be a part of European Union than a part of its neighborhood. Somewhere in between the, the reality lies, and that's what we are trying to do here. But the importance of this discussion, for me at least, that I've been hearing what people, how, how people are taking this, how the European Union, how the members of parliament are, are taking what is going on in Ukraine, and whether we live up to the expectations and as Ukraine, not, not just person, persons. What is also important to us to hear the reaction and this, the experts and the questions from, from the people outside of our immediate conversation. And the last thing I'd like, I'd like just to mention that the reaction to Mr. Daniels and I, I totally agree with you that's the right of Ukraine to expect more. I also agree with you that we have so many avenues to, to, to follow, to pursue, and we can find so many answers to all our questions within, within existing mechanism, many mechanisms. But what my office and myself will be doing, we will be extending these limits for Ukrainians to cooperate closer with the European Union and European Union to cooperate with Ukraine more effective. And Mariana, thank you very much for having and allowing us uh, moderating our discussion. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of our time. We still have a lot of questions, but you can answer this question in a written way or react somehow at this question. They're available on your screen. And uh, thank you again. Good luck. Uh, good luck. Stay safe, healthy, and uh, motivated. Yeah. Okay. Can we Thanks have, a lot. Can we have a minute? Just sorry. Sorry for interruption. I understand that we are exceeding our time, but if we can continue for probably five or ten minutes, because I see that um, Miriam Lexman had a very important comment, and probably she would want to to address that. Um, uh, and uh, probably a few questions could be still addressed. Maria, by... Maria, unfortunately, I have to. I I have to leave. I'm very sorry, but I have to leave. <laughs> but if you would like to to continue without moderator, and um, so you Daria are will will moderate. Daria will moderate. Okay. Yeah, Daria. <laughs> okay, I kind of self volunteered. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Alon. So, so I'm not an expert in uh, in international relations, but I can. I think I could try to to moderate. Um, so we 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 just got um, a very interesting comment from Miriam Lexman, and Miriam, you are now in the panel. So could you please address this uh, uh, comment directly in our live session? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I, I really don't want to take people's time because I know we are in a hurry. And, but if you would like me to elaborate a little bit on, on my question or comment, I will uh, uh, like to do that. I'm a member of the European Parliament. I joined the Parliament only now in February because there was issue with my election. Uh, many things happen also in democratic countries and member states of the European Union. I was elected in May but could join only in in February. But anyway, uh, to my comment is that uh, now the European Parliament is uh, preparing the report on the Eastern Partnership. And uh, we were with Mr. Kubilio thinking very hard what to provide as the next step to those countries who are more advanced, mainly the AA countries, because we see what uh, Ivana was uh, pointing to, that there was the association treaty, the U Ukraine actually has paid a lot and big price for it, then there was visa liberalization, and now somehow there is a next step should be enlargement, but obviously that step seems to be too far away. So uh, my thinking was to provide the three AA countries at least the access to comitology, what has the EFTA countries, which would provide space for representatives and officials from the countries to come to the negotiations, of course, without voting rights, but that will help uh, the, the administration to understand better what 
the EU is about and then pursue reforms back home, but as well it will help us Europeans to understand a little bit more what is going on in the individual countries and how to set our policy better to, to fit every country, particularly their needs. And also I think and I hope that this will lead to a proper methodology which now was set for the Western Balkans because I think we need to really balance out also the more for more approach it was a great start but now we are actually applauding only the governments but we need to find out also how to applaud the civil society if they are for example trying to do more and rather than being stopped by the government so this is a, a very general que question and i would also uh, bring up the question or the point what was done by hannah hopko because she very rightly pointed out on the geopolitical need i mean now seeing how we failed in our relationship with China and also how we are still failing in our relationship to Russia, we definitely have to strengthen our geopolitical thinking vis-a-vis -vis the Eastern Partnership. So that's uh, in, a, in a nutshell all, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, Miriam. Uh, I also uh, I read the questions and there are a few questions about the um, uh, things which Christian Danielson told at the beginning, especially about the Green Deal and how this could be integrated uh, more into the Eastern Partnership. Um, uh, there is um, a question. Uh, Christian Danielson, would you want um, to address that? And a few others, I think there was also a question which you partly answered um, in our chat, uh, but probably you would want uh, to say a little bit more. Uh, no, thanks a lot. No, uh, I think this on the Green Deal is an important one. And um, uh, first we need to uh, have clarity internally within the EU uh, how we would like to see the Green Deal being rolled out. And I think uh, the reply to that will to a large extent in fact be in what is coming in the coming weeks when it comes to the, uh, what shall we call it, the uh, recovery package or whatever it will be because that one I think we will set out clearly the ambition to see to that that recovery is done within the free framework of a modernization of the economy, taking Green Deal very much to the forefront. And I think that is something which uh, can be an, uh, a, um, uh, an example that we should look into how that one can also be relevant in the Eastern Partnership cooperation. Uh, and I think that can pass everything from uh, energy efficiency to uh, to uh, biodiversity. That was a biodiversity strategy presented yesterday. That one has parts which I think is very relevant also for Ukraine. Two, the whole issue of resources and how to handle resources. Uh, to mention three elements which are important when it comes to the Green Deal. So I think we have to clear our reflection on our side and we need to see to then how that one will articulate in the Eastern Partnership framework. We are not starting from zero because we have done quite a lot in the Eastern Partnership as well as bilaterally when it comes to energy efficiency, when it comes to issues relating to waste, when it comes to issue to, yeah, I see that we realize not completely agree with it and that's fine, we can do more, but, uh, but I still, I, there, there, there are things happening there which of course can be, can, be, uh, can be driven forward and become more. There was also a question about security and maybe I wasn't clear uh, of course, there, there is cooperation on security already with the Eastern Partnership countries individually. And I think what we would like to see and not exclude is that we bring in issues relating to, uh, to uh, uh, security sector reform. Uh, if that can be usefully addressed within the context of Eastern Partnership, I'm not looking to it. Uh, when they, in the broader sense, because that also has to do with security internally. I mentioned the issue of cyber security, I mentioned the issue of, uh, of cooperation when it comes to uh, fighting crime, which is also security. And of course, uh, uh, we also have the, the uh, missions that uh, individual members, uh, countries in the Eastern Partnership are taking part. So that is also an element which should, can, can play in, in this context. And finally, I would like to take up what was mentioned by, by, uh, by uh, uh, Viola, in fact, namely that the best way of seeing the, uh, the whole integration uh, closer, Ukraine closer to the EU, Eastern Partnership closer to the EU, is uh, reforms on the ground. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the reforms fighting corruption, it's the de-oligarchization, 
is the decentralization, if we talk about Ukraine. It is uh, the various uh, issues relating to reforms of judiciary that will provide momentum, which makes it easier for Viola and for others who are pushing very hard for Ukraine to come closer. And it makes it easier also for us on the, how should I put it, public servant side, and of course, Andreas, public service side, to be able to argue for coming closer. Whereas the opposite makes it more difficult. So, I mean, that, that we also should have in mind. But I think it was very well expressed by, by Viola. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, and I think uh, Vadim Pristaiko, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, will probably also want to address some of the questions on behalf of the Ukrainian government. Uh, thank you, Vadim, for staying with us here. I, I know that from the point of view of a government official, it's a bit tough to listen to criticism, but um, so what, what would be your response? And whether the plan suggested by Miriam um, would be something, um, you know, um, you, will, you will be satisfied with? Thank you. I was just uh, half listening, half typing the answers on some of the very tough questions people were asking uh, in course of our conversation. Some people were asking a very interesting question, what would you, how would you be able to persuade people that you as a government actually is doing some, some reform? And what I was trying to explain that uh, I'm not sure that I'll be able to, to, to persuade them. I, I don't even believe that people would trust just another bureaucrat from the Ukrainian government which has been promising the, uh, the reforms for at least last 30 years since we are independent. What I was trying to put that, although the, although this, this skepticism, we see that Ukraine is gradually moving, and uh, among the rest of the republics of former Soviet Union, the Baltics are accepted. The, the, the effect of the, of the effort, of the collective effort of Ukrainians, not just government officials, not just experts, not just journalists, or just professionals who are working in, in, on, the, on their jobs, each and every day. That's what's obvious, and that's what we are seeing each and every day. The personification of reforms, although it is simplified and easier to understand, sometimes may may make may make us make a wrong turn, and not seeing that that there is there is collective effort of Ukrainians and belief in many things which we were discussing with you today. And sometimes what is missed in this discussion, that we're some, we are talking not just about practical things, which are important people, no doubt about it, like the, I don't know, quotas and, 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 and the size of the, our trade with the European Union, and the particular things, and even security as the, as, the, as the sort of thing which we can discuss and share with the European Union as with NATO. But the idea, that's what sometimes is missed here in Ukrainian government as well, this idea which have been embedded in, in people's minds that the idea of equal approach, equal core living within the European Union, that is something which is very, very valuable in Ukrainians are to pursue this particular idea. Sometimes it's even easier to, you know, to, to put this way. So whether we can achieve many things and we, if we will be criticized in a way, yes, we, if we can, sell it back to Ukrainians and be still able to persuade them to allow us as, a, as this particular government to go this way. That's, I believe, what is happening just unfolding in front of your eyes, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vadim. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, as, as, as a right of a self-volunteer moderator, um, I would want to remind that uh, there will be zero corruption conference where we plan to address these and many other issues. It will be offline after we will be able to do that. Um, but I think even before the actual offline meeting, there are some issues which we mentioned where there could be more focus in some online events like the Green Deal. It's a very complicated issue. Or the justice and judicial reform and deoligarization is a kind of separate big a uh, big issue uh, which, could, which we could address for more than two hours. So I thank everyone who uh, talked today. I thank uh, all participants which spent uh, two hours of their life with us today. And uh, um, stay safe. Thank you.